to uh, try to sprinkle more than a little science on it. So uh, there'll be basically eight parts of this. And because uh, it's a 10 minute talk, we'll be going quite fast through all these. So why does the FDA require particle analysis? Well, um, for the past 40 years, it's been fairly well recognized that um, implant debris is the reason for um, implant uh, failure over time. And in fact, uh, reasons for long-term failure include bone fracture infection, implant fracture, but the majority, the 75% of it, is um, reaction to debris that is produced at the uh, articulating surfaces. So the majority of that is the regular old normal aseptic uh, osteolysis due to the subtle inflammation that I'll talk about a little bit. And then uh, a certain percentage of that are people that are particularly uh, reactive to debris um, and those folks are classified as hypersensitive. So implant debris is inevitable, especially multi-component implants. And in fact, uh, this slide is just pointing out that it exists at many different um, uh, 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 size scales, where you can see it in tissue from really the uh, millimeter size on down to the micron size. Uh, despite the fact that when if this debris is characterized, it'll all look like it's micron sized, uh, obviously the tissue does not handle it as such because the clumping of the particles there into large agglomerates. So uh, these particles have been known to uh, induce cytokines in the tissues, and those uh, cytokines are produced uh, primarily from uh, macrophages, which over time induce these granuloma responses as the macrophages build up, eat the debris, uh, can't uh, do anything with it when it's poly, and then uh, slowly, slowly accumulate over time and cause the uh, invasion of the bone implant interface and uh, loosening and failure over time. So macrophages are the central player in that to eat the debris. They're used to eating bacteria. We need them for that. And um, here is a macrophage full of debris. They will eat until they can't eat anymore. So there's some obvious things like uh, a greater dose of debris will create uh, a bigger inflammatory response. But there's uh, several less uh, known things like uh, smaller particles are worse than large particles only because they are judged from an implant gravimetric basis. And by that I mean uh, if your implant loses 10 milligrams of wear debris and it's four large particles, that's not going to be a problem. But if it loses 100 trillion nanometer sized particles, that's going to be more of a problem systemically and locally. So um, for articulating implants, the fear factor for companies is a uh, high mass loss and small particle size. If you had only one of those, then it wouldn't be so bad. So what is acceptance criteria for implant testing? Uh, the answer is 30 years of published literature. Um, but uh, this is not the end-all be-all, obviously. Here we see the wear rates from metal poly all the way down to failed uh, metal metal. And the uh, wear rates were pretty low for those failed metal metals. And inducing pseudotumors, not much of that anymore. So not only is it um, the particle size that you can see there with uh, metal on metal, but it's the uh, number of particles that it creates. So it's a particle size and amount of mass loss and actually shows an order of magnitude more particles than metal on poly due to the small size of those metal particles, which the order of magnitude more particles could contribute to that failure of the implant over time. So how many samples are necessary? Um, it's not uh, generally uh, uh, locked into any one particular amount of samples, but uh, I, my recommendation is three samples, at least for doing particle size analysis. That way you can do enough statistics to show that they are um, different from uh, other implants as the, from one million cycles all the way up to 10 million cycles. If they stay the same, it's enough to convince the FDA, or it should be, that um, things are what they seem. 
So for uh, non-articulating implants that are less likely to generate debris, it's less critical, less critical and the um, procedures are a little more ambiguous. So um, they do recommend still that particle size, shape, and a number of particles are characterized as well as the implant itself. So these are the standards, the STM 1877 that we follow for particle size analysis. And that's a boring aspect. So what kind of testing is necessary? Generally, of your simulator fluids, it's a metal ion and a particle analysis. And there's a couple techniques to use for particle analysis. And this is the really exciting part of the presentation. I am joking, of course. Um, but there are a number of different ways of characterizing particle size. And a seemingly very simple issue, such as what is the size of the particles, is actually deceptively complex. So here's two different particles with the same equivalent uh, volume, and yet they would have quite different biologic impacts if you were to load 100 billion of those into your knee. Um, there's also uh, two distributions of particles here, but um, one is also quite different than the other, and when they went into somebody, they would also have quite different biologic reactivities. But those are the kind of complexity that uh, uh, we don't really report, and uh, it, because it's not really known how uh, that would turn out and what to do with that. The best we can do is a mean size at this point. So why use SEM analysis and uh, low angle, both of those together? Well, SEM gives you the uh, size, aspect ratio, roundness, and shape factors that uh, the other technique cannot give you. It gives you distributions in all those ranges. Here's your shape information. And it can also look at the uh, chemical signatures of those particles to determine if they were uh, produced from corrosion or simply from wear of the implant or whether they're from the grips or fixturing or from the implant itself because a lot of times these days um, the amount of wear is so low that the uh, contaminating silicone materials make up a large percentage of wear to be. So the advantages of SEM are the small amount of sample needed, shape information is provided, and its uh, disadvantages are relatively few particles are analyzed, uh, hundreds, not the millions, that are analyzed in uh, low angle light scattering, where particles fly in front of a laser beam. It can count millions of particles per second, and uh, that's what a large particle looks like flying in front of the laser beam, and that's what a small particle. So the more rings, the smaller it is, it's easy for these machines to discriminate the two and you get both a volume and a size analysis, and a number-based analysis. Now, what is a volume versus number-based analysis? Because they give you completely different sizes uh, for the same particles there. So if I was to uh, say, here's a group of particles from an implant, what's the size of those particles? Um, you know, it would depend on whether I was talking about the total volume of the particles, or the total number of particles, because as a percentage of total number, the size is small. As a percentage of total volume, the size is large. And so a volume and a number distribution uh, should really be reported when it comes to implant debris, even if it's only uh, hundreds of particles that are backed out of an SEM analysis. So the advantage of, of LALS is the millions to billions of particles that are counted. Um, the technique allows for reanalysis. It gives you a volume distribution, which is certainly not accurate in an SEM one, where it, due to the lack of counting millions of particles, you can't find that one in a million uh, very large particle that you would see on a uh, LALS analysis. So uh, what is acceptable criteria? There's a lot of data uh, out there for um, different implants at the FDA website and um, that you can compare current implants to past implants when it comes to where particle size, particle number. Um, there, it's easier for uh, spinal implants to meet accepted amounts for metal on poly and ceramic on poly because of the lower wear rates associated with spinal devices compared to hips and knees. And so um, what is acceptable is out there from a particle size perspective as well. Our conclusions are to follow guidance documents, 
uh, to freeze solutions, just in case you don't want to do particle analysis now, to do them later on. That'll prevent them from being uh, metal debris, from being digested by bacteria over the long term and for it to turn into some sort of horrible soup that smells terrible. And uh, LALS is more important than SEM when there's a lot of mass, a lot of powder, and um, to understand how much of the debris is large. And that is critical because if there's a lot of large debris, that debris is not going to be as much in number. The dose goes way down. The concerns for its biologic reactivity go down. And as, uh, however, SEM is necessary to get shape information. Um, FDA concerns about particle-induced effects are justifiably growing based on the metal-on-metal -metal debris that relatively little in mass created a rather large response, enough that metal-on-metal -metal hips are now uh, less than 1% of the market. So uh, make sure individual summary reports are included as part of a multi-sample analysis, and uh, finally make sure that uh, cumulative reports are also uh, included, that way uh, you can just cut and paste text on terms of final submissions. And uh, here is just a bunch of references because this will be available online. You can just pause this and take a look at these in case you have any need for that. And uh, thank you for your attention.